The feast we celebrate today is an event of great joy and hope. In a sense, it's kind of like the beginning of our redemption, when the Mother of God came into this world. And this is a very great event also, because unlike the rest of us who are sinners, when we are born, Our Lady was in sanctifying grace at her birth. In fact, she was absolutely perfect in every way. She was already filled to the brim with every possible grace and virtue that she needed as the Mother of God. You may notice that with the saints of the Church, we never celebrate their physical birthday. We celebrate the day they died, the day they went into heaven. And the reason is that the saints were not saints when they were born. They were sinners when they were born, with original sin on their souls. But if you look at the calendar of the church, you will see that there are two people whose birthdays are celebrated with a feast. One of which is today, of course, and the other is that of St. John the Baptist, whose birthday is celebrated because, if you remember... He was sanctified in his mother's womb, so he was holy when he was born. Our Lady was also holy at her birth, but she is different from St. John the Baptist in that she was also conceived without original sin. And she was filled with every possible grace from the very first moment of her conception. We should imagine ourselves today, Our Lady as a newborn baby, a tiny infant. When she was born, she looked in to, to human appearances to be just a regular baby. But in the eyes of God and of the angels, she was already at the h- higher than the highest angel in heaven in terms of the brightness of her soul and her holiness that tiny infant. And even though she was a human being like us, it's almost like the comparison stops there. She is so far above all of us in dignity and honor that in the Canticle of Canticles it says about her, as the lily among thorns, so is my beloved among the daughters. Of course, Our Lady is is the lily in that comparison, and all of the rest of the human race, all of us, we are the thorns. All we do is cause pain to others, and like thorns, our souls are ugly to look at, and they produce nothing useful. So, what an appropriate image it is to compare us to thorns. But Our Lady is like the most beautiful flower, the lily, is not only beautiful to look at, but it also gives off a sweet fragrance, like the odor of sanctity with with the sweet smell of her virtues. As soon as our first parents fell in the Garden of Eden, God promised to send a woman whose child would crush the head of the serpent. God said to the serpent, I will put enmities between thee and the woman. She shall crush thy head. Sorry, between thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head. And thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. And the woman in this prophecy is Our Lady. Her child would crush the devil. But God said he would put an enmity between the child of Our Lady and the children of the devil. The people of this world. the the, the wicked. There has been a conflict between the followers of Christ, the virtuous, and the wicked of this world since the very beginning. And it will continue thus until the end of time so that we can expect to be persecuted by the wicked. This is prophesied. And if wicked people don't persecute us, we should wonder what side we are actually on. In this conflict. But in any case, today we celebrate the beginning of the fulfillment of this prophecy that was made to Adam and Eve in the very beginning of the human race. 
Our Lady was like an immense gift that God gave to the world. But to understand just how great this gift was, we have to understand her dignities and her great privileges that she had that placed her so far above everyone else. To understand this, we all we have to say about her is that she was the mother of God. And all of her uh, all of her dignities and virtues came from this honor. Now, it's important for us to understand the Catholic doctrine on Our Lady's divine maternity. We are not saying that Our Lady is the mother of the divinity. Obviously, God is eternal and he has no beginning. So it would be incorrect to say that Our Lady is the mother of the divinity. But she conceived and brought forth that blessed man who subsisted by the second person of the Blessed Trinity. In the Incarnation, the human nature of Christ was assumed in a hypostatical manner, which means God assumed it substantially. His human nature was assumed by God. It was united to the person of God the Son. This is the teaching of the Church. This means, though, that the actions our Lord did in his human nature are the actions of the second person of the Blessed Trinity. This is why St. Paul says that we are redeemed by the blood of God. And along with the Church, we also say that God was born of the Virgin Mary, and he suffered and died on the cross, because he did it in that human nature which he had wonderfully taken upon himself with Our Lady as his mother. This is an incomprehensible mystery. And this doctrine is something we can never fully understand, but sometimes it helps us to understand a mystery by studying some of the errors that the people have made in explaining this mystery, which were condemned by the Church as heresies. For example, in the early church, there was a heretic named Nestorius who taught that there were, he denied that Our Lady was the mother of God. He taught there were two persons in Christ as well as two natures. He said there was a divine person as well as a human person in Christ. That they were united in him and he said that Christ was a human being who had the divinity dwelling inside of him like in a temple. He said that Our Lady was not the mother of God, but only the mother of the man Christ, whom he said was not the same as the Christ who was God. This is false and uh, heretical, obviously, because there is only one Christ, and in him both the divine nature and the human nature are united in the divine person, so that Christ is truly God and truly man. But he only has one person, which is the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Our Lady is the mother of God because she brought forth him who is God, although he only took his human nature from her. His divine nature is eternal. And of course, Nestorius was condemned in the Council of Ephesus, And the church reaffirmed the correctness of the title Mother of God that we give to Our Lady. In fact, even before Nestorius, there were many fathers of the church that that used that exact term to describe Our Lady, Mother of God, which proves that that doctrine is from sacred tradition. In fact, Our Lady was called the Mother of God by Catholics ever since the very beginning of the church. The dignity of being the mother of God is the highest dignity that any creature is able to be raised to. We can't imagine any closer union between any creature and the creator of all things. We can't think of any name more beautiful or any privilege more amazing than being the mother of God. St. Anselm explains this. He says, 
Listen, O oh man, and be filled with an ecstasy of astonishment in contemplating this miracle. The infinite God had only one only begotten co-eternal Son. Yet he would not allow him to remain only his own, but would also have him to be the only son of Mary. St. Bernard points out the fact that Our Lady was obedient, I'm sorry, Our Lord was obedient to Our Lady as his mother. And he says this should fill us with astonishment because it is a humility beyond any example that God should obey a woman. He says, for a woman to command God is a power also without any parallel. Our Lady's role as, as the Mother of God is a deep mystery. And even though no creature can be given an infinite dignity, any creature is inherently finite, yet for Our Lady to command the infinite God is the closest that any creature could possibly come to having an infinite dignity in having a certain power over what is infinite, God himself. St. Ambrose gives us a beautiful exhortation to imitate Mary, and he paints a sort of a word picture of her personality. This is so beautiful that it's worth quoting it at some length. He says, Who is more noble than the mother of God? She was humble in her heart, grave in her words, wise in her, re in her resolutions. She spoke seldom and little. She read assiduously, and she placed her confidence not in unreliable riches, but in the prayers of the poor. She was so filled with fervor that she would have no witness of her heart, but God alone, to whom she gave herself, and everything that she did and had. She injured nobody, was good to everyone. She honored her superiors, did not envy her equals. She shunned vain glory, followed reason, and ardently loved virtue. Her looks were sweet, her discourse mild, and her behavior modest. Her charity knew no bounds. She was temperate in her diet. She prolonged her fasts for several days, and the most ordinary food was her choice, not to please the taste, but to sustain her nature. It was not her custom to go outside except to the temple, and this always with her relatives. The Church has observed this feast of the birthday of Our Lady probably since the very beginning, but we certainly have records of this feast going back over a thousand years at the least. And we should honor Our Lady too on this feast day of hers. She is even more generous than usual on her great feast days, not because she celebrates her birthdays the way we do, but because we give her greater love and honor on her feast days than during the rest of the year. And this opens up the treasuries of heaven even wider than they usually are. We should ask for some special favor from Our Lady today. And we can be sure that when she brings our request to our Lord, he will not turn her down. He obeyed her while he was on earth. And she had such great love and care for him in this, on this earth. Such great compassion for him in his sufferings. And she devoted her entire life to him that we can have confidence he will hear her request. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.